Hello, this episode of the podcast is sponsored by italki, and if you're finding it difficult to improve your fluency in English on your own, don't worry, because you can use italki to get some talking time or English lessons and build your English in the most natural way possible by using it to communicate. And italki are offering all of my listeners a free voucher worth $10 when you buy some lessons. Uh, so it's basically buy one, get one free. Uh, to get that, that offer, go to teacherluke.co.uk slash talk or click an italki logo on my website. You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Luke's English Podcast. Here is a brand new episode for you to listen to. How are you today? You doing all right? I hope so. Are you ready for a new episode? Yes, you are? Good. You should be ready because here is a new episode. You're listening to it right now. So let's get started. This is a film club episode of Luke's English Podcast today because in this one, I'm going to talk to you about a really great documentary film that you can watch on Netflix or on DVD. And it's about the true story of a mountain climbing adventure which goes horribly wrong and then turns into an epic battle for survival. It's an incredible story and a fantastic documentary which won six awards, including a BAFTA for Best British Film in 2004. The film is called Touching the Void. Touching the Void. And a void, that's V-O-I-D. A void is basically like a, a large, frightening space like a large, uh, frightening space, em totally empty, uh, dark and frightening space. Um, like, for example, you know, out, out, outside in the galaxy, the darkness of space is kind of a void. Or imagine like a, 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 a huge hole in the ground, like a totally dark, empty hole. That could be described as a void as well. Um, so like a, a scary, dark, empty space. Uh, and this film is called Touching the Void. And I, I guess the, the title of the film should become clear as you learn more about what actually happens in the story. Um, so um, the film is not a new one. It's over 10 years old now. But it is a film which has stayed with me uh, ever since I first watched it. Um, and I often remember it and I feel like there's a lot to learn from it in terms of the language that you can hear in the film, but also about life in general. And so I'm going to talk about Touching the Void in some detail in order to use the film as a kind of case study for understanding the importance of motivation and attitude in achieving difficult challenges. And in this case, I'm talking about the challenge of, of learning a language like English. But it could apply to any challenge that you face in your life, especially ones that can feel, that, that can feel overwhelming and insurmountable. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all about trying... Uh, being able to uh, surmount uh, seemingly insurmountable challenges. Now, uh, you might be thinking, oh, but I don't like mountain climbing. I don't like mountain climbing, so I think I'll skip this episode. You might be thinking that. Well, if that's what you're thinking, then I suggest that you don't skip it, actually, because the story in this film is amazing. It's dramatic, it's scary, it's a bit funny at times, and it's really profound as well. And it's it's not just about going up a big piece of rock for no reason. Uh, it's about a lot more than that. So stick with it, okay? Even if mountain climbing isn't your thing, um, I hope that you stick with this episode and listen to the whole thing. I, I really want you to hear the entire story. I think it's worth it. And also, I've put some work into this episode, so I, you know, I think that it, it should be uh, quite a good one, even if you're not into rock climbing. Um, as, as is often the case, a lot of the text that I'm reading... Uh, is on the page for this episode, so you can check it out um, at teacherluke.co.uk. Some of this episode is scripted, and some of it is improvised on the spot. It's a kind of a mix of the two. But if you want to read the words that I'm saying, um, or uh, if you hear a particular phrase or a bit of uh, vocabulary, um, then you can see a lot of it written on the the, the the uh, page for this episode on my website. Also, if you're transcribing this one, um, don't forget to copy and paste these words, these notes on my website into your Google document, and then you can just add any extra bits that I say. 
All right. Um, so you'll also find some links, some uh, other YouTube videos, and some more content that you might want to look at because you'll find it interesting and you can use it to help you to learn English. Uh, like, for example, some of the specific vocabulary that you'll hear me using in this episode. And some videos, like video clips of Touching the Void. Now, uh, I said before that in this episode, I'd like us to consider the, the importance of motivation and attitude when dealing with a challenge, okay? Um, so before we go into the film in uh, more detail, let's start, actually, by considering the challenge of learning English. So we know that learning English can be tough, uh, there's no doubt that if you want to get a really advanced level uh, in adulthood, uh, it's a challenge which must be met with some effort and determination. Um, it is a challenge, but it can also be really enjoyable, of course. Um, it, it, sh- you know, it should be a really enjoyable process as well as being a bit of a challenge. But if you're really serious about learning English properly, it is quite a challenge and that does demand time and effort. And you could compare the whole thing to climbing a mountain. And I've mentioned this mountain climbing metaphor before on the podcast, but let's flesh it out a little bit more here. So when you look at the whole challenge of learning a language from the beginning, from the start point, it can seem really difficult. It's comparable to standing at the bottom of a mountain, looking up at the whole thing that you're about to climb. And it's the case, you know, wherever you are on the mountain, even if you're halfway up the mountain or near, fairly, fairly near the top, uh, whenever you look up and see how much further you've got to go, it still sort of feels like a, an insurmountable challenge, especially when you look at the mountain from, from you know, from the ground, you know. Um, you know, you even think to yourself, getting to this point was a long journey. But there it is. The mountain is stretching up to the sky, thousands of meters above you, and the summit of the mountain might even be invisible to you. Um, you know, it might be that you can't even see it because it's above the clouds. So that is kind of like the, my metaphor of looking at the whole language and realizing how far you have to go before you get to where you want to be. Um, you know, now you might be thinking, you know, you might be thinking, okay, let's go, let's do this. Okay. In fact, I'm sure that many of you relish that kind of challenge. Equally, if you're a mountain climber and you see a mountain, you might be, you know, desperate to get up onto the mountain and start climbing it. Um, And if that's the case as well in terms of your language learning, that's great that you relish the challenge. That's fantastic. And that's why you're into learning English. Excellent. But I wouldn't be surprised if sometimes you look at the whole challenge, the whole mountain, and you think to yourself, there's no way I can get all the way up to the top. It's so high. It's so massive. It seems so remote. Uh, Certainly when you compare yourself to the mountain, the relative sizes of you and the mountain, you can feel dwarfed by the challenge. And if you've ever climbed a mountain, you'll know what I mean. Also, if you've ever had to learn a language from scratch, you'll know what I mean as well. Sometimes just getting up off your sofa to switch off a light seems like a massive effort. Just getting out of bed in the morning can seem like too much to achieve, especially on those bad days when you're feeling depressed or something. Now imagine standing at the bottom of a huge and ancient mountain and looking all the way up to the top. It feels like it's miles away. It doesn't seem real somehow. It feels almost unimaginable that you could get to the top of it on your two feet. For me, when I consider my French, I feel a bit like this. Every single day, I'm reminded of the challenge ahead of me because I hear fluent French being spoken all around me. And even though I do understand a lot of it, it's like each time I'm trying to play a computer game at an insanely high difficulty setting. I play the game, but I rarely feel like I'm winning. So I open my French study books at home and I see the challenge ahead of me. I look at all of the different verb conjugations of all the many, many verbs. And sometimes just getting through one page is difficult. Each verb conjugation, each little bit of syntax is a mini challenge of its own. And then I think of all of the thousands of other words and sentences that I have to master in order to get to the level that I want. And I get a bit demoralized. I get into a negative frame of mind. I know I shouldn't, but the the truth is it does happen. I wonder if you ever feel the same way about your English. I wonder if you ever feel um, a bit sort of overwhelmed by the challenge. 
Anyway, the point is, the point here is that we can do it. We can do it. We can achieve our goals in the language that we're learning. It's definitely possible. Where there's a will, there's a way. It's just like any big challenge. Half the battle is in the way that you approach the challenge, the way that you look at it, and the way you choose to deal with it. Attitude is half the battle. In fact, some people would say it's all in the mind. It's about attitude as much as it is about having the stamina and doing the legwork. If you get the attitude and the motivation right, um, then the, the, the work doesn't feel like work. Um, the impossible challenge becomes possible. It's just a question of mind over matter. Because you are capable of doing incredible things. It's just a question of whether or not you believe you can do it and whether you push yourself to do it. So here now are some tips on how to approach that challenge, the challenge of trying to climb up a mountain or to get to a high level in English, just to give you some motivation to make it to the top. So here are some tips for, let's say, uh, helping you raise your level in English uh, or climb a mountain. And I guess these are ways in which climbing a mountain and, and learning English are similar. They're not the same, obviously, We'll, we'll look at that as well in a moment. So first thing is stop focusing on the top. Stop focusing on the top. Stop kind of focusing on this, this sort of level of perfection. Instead, just aim for a point which is not too far ahead of you. Somewhere attainable, just over there, just ahead of you and within reach. Aim for that spot and try to get there. And when you get there, do it again. Like aim a little bit further ahead of you and try and get to that spot. So each time you just place the target a few steps beyond you and then break the whole thing down into small chunks. Sometimes that means going one step at a time, just focusing on every single step you make. And sometimes you might even slip back a little bit, but you keep going. Uh, And with the mountain, you're trying to reach the peak, of course. You're trying to get to the summit. But with learning English, really, the sky's the limit. There's always more that you can learn and more ways that you can become a better and better uh, communicator. So the sky's the limit. The end of the process, really, is just the point at which you decide that there's nothing left to learn. So really, there shouldn't be a top in terms of learning English. And to be honest, this is kind of where the mountain metaphor breaks down a bit. But anyway... um, So there shouldn't really be a top. Instead, it's like a repeated systematic process which you do bit by bit every day. And it's like going to the gym, essentially. You know, imagine going to the gym. You go to the gym in order to get physically fit, but you don't stop when you get fit. You just keep doing it. You have you, you keep doing it. You keep maintaining, improving, diversifying, consolidating, reviewing, and covering more and more ground each time. Um, so the next point is be positive. You've got to be positive uh, when you're facing a challenge like this. Accentuate the positives rather than worrying about the challenge as a whole. Enjoy each step. Enjoy each little achievement. Take time to enjoy the view and breathe the fresh air. In terms of language, enjoy the things that you learn and remember to feel good about what you can do and what you've achieved so far while also pushing yourself further. It might be difficult and even painful sometimes, for example, when you make mistakes or you fail to express yourself or something, but you are capable of great things. You just need to push yourself. When climbing a mountain, you'll be surprised. You'll feel exhausted at some moments, but if you ask your body to go further, it will. Um, Similarly, with learning a language, your brain can remember everything. You can you can string all these sentences together. It's just a question of pushing yourself a little bit further and not accepting defeat. Uh, Third thing, remember, it's about the journey, not the destination, which means enjoy the process. Enjoy it. People climb mountains all the time and they do it because it's enjoyable. There's no reason that you can't do it too, as long as you take the right approach and enjoy the journey. Similarly, in English, It's vital that you enjoy it while it's happening and that you consider it to be something that you can enjoy. Listening to or reading 
um, interesting and entertaining content, discovering a new way to think and express yourself, meeting interesting new people, finding out more about the world and finding your own unique voice and expressing yourself in a new language. It's all part of the fun, like discovering a new place on your mountain climbing trip or even a new part of yourself with your new voice in another language. Um, Another point is that rhythm is important. Rhythm. Uh, Get a rhythm going and let that rhythm drive you forwards. Getting started is the first challenge. It's probably the biggest challenge in a sense, getting started. But once you have started, keeping a habitual rhythm going is the next thing. Keep that up and you'll make progress. You'll make the progress that you need. In climbing, it's about it's a good to set a certain pace and keep it up. You create a rhythm with your, the steps that you take. Um, you don't notice each step after a while because you're beating out a rhythm. Similarly, in English, set a rhythm of daily practice. Make it a habit and just beat out this rhythm of daily practice. Um, and after a while, you don't notice really that you're doing work. It just becomes part of this this daily rhythm. And similarly, in the way that you speak, of course, rhythm is important. Um, You've got to kind of develop a rhythm in your voice, uh, which is where you sort of, that's how you build fluency into what you do. Um, uh, Another point is prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. Get the equipment uh, right. Get the right equipment. Get the food. Check the weather and all that sort of thing. And for learning English... This means preparing yourself by getting the right attitude, by making a learning plan, by um, creating learning goals, which you can aim for, by getting some materials, uh, notepads, apps, grammar books, podcasts and things like that. Getting all that stuff together, preparing yourself and then using it all. So prepare yourself. Be prepared. Uh, You might want to get a guide. On the mountain, you need someone, maybe a local person, who can help to lead you along the correct path. But in learning English, you could find a teacher. You might need a language partner or or a teacher or someone who can help you. Uh, Maybe you could find a one-to-one teacher on italki, for example, or something like that. Um, And, um, you know, you could maybe find someone who's already learned English and is a few steps ahead of you and you can sort of use them to help you or you can uh, learn English from uh, your teacher or something but you might need someone to guide you through the process. Um, Another point is that you should do it with other people. Um, It's fun to share the challenge with a group. It's fun to climb with other people and enjoy the general camaraderie uh, of of climbing together and similarly in english it's good to have a peer group it's good to have a group of people who are sharing the challenge with you it could be for example a group of people in the comments section of the website or with your conversation club that you might be organizing in your local area but in any case it's good to kind of get a community of people around you a peer group who can share the challenge with you and it makes it a lot more fun and achievable Um, another point is that you should train yourself with some controlled work. So that would mean going to the gym and doing intensive strength and fitness work to prepare you for the physical challenge of climbing the mountain or for your English to do some uh, episode transcriptions with the transcription collaboration team or do some shadowing where you listen and repeat and try and uh, you know try and repeat uh, what you're hearing exactly the same way as, as it's uh, spoken on the on the podcast episode or something or get yourself some grammar self-study books and work from those but training with some control practice can really help okay right so I think that's as far as I can stretch this particular metaphor that learning English is a bit like climbing a mountain I think I've probably stretched the metaphor as far as it will go but what do you think can you think of any other similarities between climbing a mountain and learning English can you think of any other similar similar things? And what about any differences? Can you think of any major differences? Obviously, the, the mountain metaphor is just that. It's just a metaphor. Uh, learning a language uh, isn't exactly the same. In, in fact, in some ways, it's easier than climbing a mountain, which is the good news. You could say that it's actually easier. There's First of all, there's a lot less risk involved. Um, I don't think anyone has ever been seriously injured while trying to learn a language. 
Uh, have you? I don't think so. No, nobody ever says, you know, learning a language, be careful, you might break a leg. You know, no one ever says that. I know a guy who slipped on a phrasal verb and now he's paralysed, said nobody ever. So I think it's not that risky. No one's ever broken their tongue learning a language, right? You know, like imagine you sort of turn up at uh, you turn up at work one day and you've got bandages and a, and a crutch and your head's wrapped up in bandages and people are like, oh my God, what happened to you? And you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm learning French. Uh, it's a risky business. Um, so I don't think you can, there's, I don't think there is uh, anywhere near the level of risk, of course. I mean, you might get a bruised ego. Your confidence might take a knock sometimes. Uh, but there's no need for emergency helicopters or helmets, ropes, first aid or dramatic documentaries about a fight for survival. Uh, if you can imagine that, you know, like uh, Jose Gonzalez was a student who decided to work on his English one summer. He chose to enrol on an English language course at his local college. Little did he know that this would be the start of an epic fight for survival from which he would barely escape alive. Um, I can't imagine a documentary like that about that. It would. It might be good, though. A, dra- a dramatic documentary about learning English. Um, or maybe some sort of um, Hollywood action movie based around the idea of the, the, the sort of uh, drama of learning English, you know, coming this summer, one man, one grammar book, no hope for survival. Dum, 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 dum. It's too confusing. There are too many verb forms. Dum, 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 dum. Help, help. How do you pronounce this adjective? Where's the word stress? Too late, motherfucker. Wait, wait, wait. It's a third conditional. I've got this. No, God damn it. It's a future pr- prediction based on current evidence. Get out of there. She's going to blow. In a world where the difference between present perfect and past simple is the difference between life and certain death. It's a past perfect continuous passive verb form. No! Only one man has all the answers. Arnold Schwarzenegger, you've been conjugated. Robert De Niro, you're talking to me. You're talking to me. Al Pacino, say hello to my little friend, the auxiliary fucking verb. Christopher Walken. I like the way you construct your sentence, but it doesn't mean shit. Liam Neeson, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want, because your English is awful. I can't understand a word you're saying. Clint Eastwood, you're going to conjugate that verb in the third person? You're going to whistle Dixie. Michael Caine, how many times do I have to tell you it's just an auxiliary verb? It's not that important. Al Pacino, again. Be, do, have, you're breaking my fucking balls here. Barack Obama. I don't know why I'm in this film. Sir Sean Connery. If you can say this sentence, it'll shave your life. She shells, she shells on the seashore. What did he say? I don't know. Just when you thought it was safe to open your mouth. From writer director Raymond Murphy. English exam two. Language feedback based on a true story. So obviously that movie would never get made. Um, although it, it would be great, wouldn't it, if it was? That would, wouldn't that be brilliant? Uh, but it's never going to happen because learning English is not that dangerous or dramatic, thank God. All right, so going back to the mountain climbing analogy, of course, one big difference between learning a language and climbing a mountain is that learning the language is much, much safer. Also, you don't need a mountain, which helps, doesn't it? You can do it anywhere, uh, so it's probably much easier and much less risky. Now, uh, on this podcast, I like to help you in your language learning process, and I try to do that in a few different ways, like, for example, telling you some stories to hopefully keep you engaged while you practice listening, 
or also recommending some resources that you can use to learn English. And in this episode, I'm going to try and do both of those things because I'm going to talk about this amazing documentary film that you can get on DVD or watch on Netflix. Here are a few facts about the film. It was directed by Kevin MacDonald, who also directed uh, films like The Last King of Scotland and Marley, the Bob Marley documentary. Um, it is a documentary uh, film telling the true story of Joe Simpson, Simon Yates and Richard Hawking. And it features those three men telling the story in their own words with some reconstructed scenes on the mountain using actors. So it's like a mixture of talking heads, the three guys telling the, the true story in their own words, a mix of that with a recreation of the events using actors. And the, the recreation is really amazing, the way that they've um, like uh, used actors on a mountain and also looked incredibly dangerous film to make. It looks like they went through a lot of the 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 same challenges that the uh the original people went through while making the film so it's a kind of a stunning achievement uh too and uh it was it was released in 2003 it won six awards in 2004, including a BAFTA for Best British Film. It's on Netflix. It's on DVD. I strongly recommend that you get a copy of this or, or watch it. Uh, remember, on both Netflix and on DVD, usually you can switch on the subtitles and just watch like that with uh, the English subtitles. Or you can just watch it without subtitles. Or you can do a sort of combination of the two. Maybe watch it without once and then watch it with again. You know, mix it up. You should be aware that I'm going to do spoilers for this film in this episode. I'm going to tell the whole story pretty much. So spoiler alert. To be honest, I don't think this episode will ruin the film. I don't think it will spoil the film for you. So if you listen to this and then watch the movie, I honestly don't think it's going to ruin the, the your enjoyment of the film. In fact, it could even help you to enjoy uh, the documentary even more. Um, like, I mean, anyway, first of all, we already know when we watch the film that all the characters survived because we see them telling their story. So we already know that they all survive. Uh, so we do know the outcome of the story. But how the hell they actually did it is another question. And that's the interesting thing about the documentary. You get to follow this guy all the way through this unbelievable ordeal. Um, so I think maybe the commentary I'm going to give you in this episode, um, if anything, will just help you to, to sort of understand it a little bit more. Um, so it, I don't think it will spoil the film. Uh, and I, you know, I've watched the movie multiple times and I sort of enjoy it the same amount every time. The purpose ultimately is to allow you to learn English from this film. And I'm recording this episode in order to make the film more accessible for you, opening up the story, hopefully creating more interest for you so that you can explore the documentary and the book in your own time. Because um, there's a book uh, about this as well, which you could read. Uh, so you could explore the documentary and the book in your own time and pick up language from them in your own way. So here are just a few suggestions for how you could use this episode. So you could listen to the episode, listen to me telling the story and follow it all and then watch the documentary in English with or without subtitles and hopefully you'll appreciate it more and you'll be able to follow and understand it even better. Or you stop listening to this right now, you watch the documentary and then you come back to this episode later or you could just listen to this episode and never see the documentary which I expect, to be honest, many of you out there will will do because for one reason or another, you just don't get around to finding the DVD or you just don't have Netflix. But I urge you to watch it because it will grip your attention and you won't regret it. You get a proper feeling of the conditions, of the beauty of the mountain, the harsh conditions and the nature of the environment with all the sounds of the ice and the snow. It's terrifically atmospheric. You'll hear the characters describe the story in their own words, which is fantastic. Plus, it will reinforce a lot of the English that you're picking up right now as you listen to this. And generally, the English that you'll hear in the documentary is clear, well-spoken and full of the grammar uh, in the form of uh, full of full of grammar in the form of uh, 
uh, narrative tenses, ways of talking about the past, descriptive vocabulary of the experience they had, and also things like ways of expressing regret and conditional uh, structures about the past, hypothetical language for talking about events in the past. Uh, You'll find a link to the DVD on uh, Amazon uh, on the page for this episode. Uh, The book as well. I also suggest that you get Joe Simpson's book, which is also called Touching the Void, It's Joe's full account of the story, so you get all the details in his own voice, and it's written clearly in good English. Um, Simpson is a writer of a few books, actually, all exploring the experiences of climbing and the mad, dangerous adventures that he's had. Apparently, there is a sequel to Touching the Void, which I haven't read, and he's a successful writer, so you could check out his books. So, let's now get stuck into the story of this film, all right? So, here's the story. Now, I hope that you're feeling comfortable and that you are somewhere warm and cosy because things are going to get a little bit chilly and uncomfortable in this story, okay? So, the main protagonists are... The ma- the two main protagonists are Joe Simpson and Simon Yates. There's also a third guy called Richard Hawking. But Joe Simpson and Simon Yates, particularly Joe Simpson, he's the one who wrote the book. Now, um, uh, Joe and Simon, um, when this happened to them, um, when this actually happened, they were both passionate young climbers from the UK, both in their 20s, I guess in their mid mid-20s, both of them already quite experienced climbers in peak physical condition, in, in peak physical shape, but still at that age, uh, probably quite immature and a little bit reckless, like so many young men are at that age. You know, like young men in their 20s tend to be quite reckless. Um, they tend to do sort of crazy, dangerous things like, you know, going climbing or doing adrenaline sports or driving too fast. So, you know, typical young guys um, up for a challenge, but maybe a little bit reckless. Now, um, in the documentary, you hear them talking about their reasons for climbing, and they said that they did it for fun. And it, I mean, it must be amazing to be out there in, in, these, in the wilderness, basically, um, just you versus the mountain. It must be an incredible feeling. The mountain in question in this documentary, the mountain that they climbed, was called Ciula Grande, which is in Peru. It's in the Andes. It's 6,344 metres high. That's 6.3 kilometres up 6.3 kilometers in the into the air that's how high it is that's really high uh it's one of the biggest mountains in the andes in in peru and so uh joe and simon were in peru climbing and they wanted to climb the ciula grand and uh, they met richard the third guy while traveling in lima and Richard wasn't a climber, but they convinced him to join them so that he could just hang out at base camp. So you know the way these things work uh, when you're climbing a mountain. You have uh, a, a, a base camp near the foot of the mountain or part the, part of the way up the mountain. And that's where you you know have your tent and all your supplies and stuff like that. Um, and so Richard basically stayed at base camp while Joe and Simon uh, climbed up the mountain. Now, Richard says that he didn't really know what he was letting himself in for. He didn't really realise quite what was going to happen. He thought he was just going to spend a few days chilling out uh, at the campsite. He didn't expect uh, the sort of dramatic uh, stuff um, that actually happened in the story to take place. Um so, Ciula Grand, the mountain. Um, now, Ciula Grand had been climbed um, on the north face. So, apparently, people had managed to climb the north face of the mountain in the 1930s. But no one had ever climbed the west face of the mountain, even though lots of people apparently had tried and failed. So, the west face of the mountain was the one that they would attempt to climb. And they perhaps arrogantly or maybe justifiably assumed that the, that they were better than all those other people who tried to climb the mountain but failed in the past. They just assumed that they were better and that they would be able to do it. And Joe and Simon used this climbing technique called alpine style, which is where you pack everything into a bag and you just try and climb the mountain in one single go. For example, you know, you don't you you don't really sort of 
go up and create another base camp and stay there for a few days and then go up to the next bit. You just do it in one big climb, basically. Uh, so you just go up on your own in one go. Uh, and it's risky because if it means basically if something goes wrong, then you'll be very exposed up there. Um, also, there was no helicopter rescue. No facilities at base camp at all. Literally just a tent with a guy and a, a few bits of food um, and some running water, you know, the, the, the river coming off the glacier. No real facilities and no helicopter rescue, no hospital, nothing. Um, I mean, it's crazy, really, when you think about it. Also, there was no preset route. Uh, no preset route up the mountain. They just climbed up and they were just attached to each other by a rope. So the first one went up. So imagine there's just two guys going up the mountain and the only thing that they've got is a rope attaching the two of them together. So they're both attached to each other by a single rope. The first one would go up attaching pins or devices into the mountain, attaching screws into the rock or the ice, and then attaching the rope to that and going up like that sort of, uh, hooking themselves the first one would hook himself into the mountain as he went up and the second one presumably would climb up unattaching those things as they went okay so if one person falls they're basically caught by the attachment to the rock that the first person was putting in yeah so they they're both relying on the first person to uh, attach themselves to the rock as they go up either that or just the, the other guy to hold on i suppose so if one person fell, you had to trust the, the the few attachments that had been put into the rock. And the other one had to just hold on as well. It's absolutely nuts, really. Trusting your life to a spike of metal hammered into a crack or screwed into the ice. And also trusting your life to your climbing partner as well. Um, to be honest, this was a very risky, even stupid thing to do. But that's what they lived for. And they were very good at it. They describe the movement of climbing. Uh, apparently, it's like ballet or gymnastics. So how does it feel to climb? I don't know if you've ever done it, but there is a certain joy to mountain climbing. I used to be a climber. Uh, I've, you know, I never climbed big mountains or anything. I used to do you know, mainly indoor climbing uh, with a bit of outdoor climbing as well. But there is a, a, a really great feeling and a sort of rhythm that you get into um and it's 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 really fantastic and also when you're out in the wilderness when you're on the mountain really it's just a chance to get away from all of the rubbish that you have in your in our in our world um simon i think described it as getting away from all the clutter that we have in our world all these bits and pieces that just sort of uh surround us you know all these bits and pieces all this stuff in the world that we don't really need so climbing a mountain is just a way to get away from all of that stuff um now the fact that they were attached to each other going up the mountain meant that they had to have an immense amount of trust in each other and then there would have been moments where they thought you know don't fall here for goodness sake or if your partner falls and his gear rips out, if it all comes out of the wall, then you're going to go down as well. So trust is absolutely vital in this kind of climbing. You're putting your trust in the other person completely. You have to rely on your partner completely. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, I've climbed before. And it. I mean, even in an indoor climbing centre, when you're just sort of, I don't know, 20 metres up a wall... Uh, even in those situations, it can feel terrifying. It really can. When you're getting close to the top, you've climbed all the way up to the top of the route and um, you you bring the rope with you and you just need to attach yourself into the top uh, hook, the, you know, the, the, the top attachment. And, you know, you're tired and you're stressed and maybe your fingertips are a little bit sweaty and you're ha hanging on with your left hand, which isn't very strong, and you're trying to hook the rope over. Um, it's a nerve-wracking moment. And if you look down, you realise there's just nothing. It's just a void between you and the floor. And, I mean, it, it sends a chill down my spine when I think about it sometimes. And I have, uh, I have fallen off climbing walls before. I remember once falling off a wall indoors 
And so basically I was trying to climb over this overhang and I was lead climbing, which means that that's when you take the rope with you and you hook yourself in as you go up. So I was trying to get over this overhang and the thing is that I'd hooked myself in below and I was trying to climb up and hook myself in above myself. But I was on an overhang and I couldn't quite hold on. I was trying to clip in and my left hand slipped and I I fell and because I was right at the end, you know, because I was right next to the next uh, attachment, I fell the whole length of the rope and then I fell the length of the rope again. And because I was on, on an overhang, I, I fell all the way down and I swung back in to the wall and slammed into the wall. Wham! Like that. And because I'd fallen that far and the rope moved, my friend who was like, you know, belaying for me, my friend got pulled by the force of me me falling he got pulled towards me so i fell swung slammed into the wall and my friend was pulled across and slammed into the back of me and it made a huge noise and everyone in the climbing center stopped and looked at me because that kind of thing is not really you know it's kind of frowned upon sort of falling dramatically like that and that was just in an indoor climbing area um we were both fine but it just shows that it's you know it can be pretty dangerous but for them, for Joe and Simon, the risk was exactly uh, what they were looking for. And um, because we live in a world where there isn't much risk anymore. In fact, there are whole industries around the reduction of risk in daily life. The world is relatively safe now compared to before. So it's quite rare that you're in great danger at any moment. I mean, crossing the street is probably as dangerous as it gets or just driving on the motorway. So some people go searching for risk because it makes them feel more alive. Right, so on day one of their climb, on day one, they did lots of climbing and they felt really, really good at the end of it. Um, So day one was a good day. Uh, And at the end of day one, they took some rest. And in order to sleep or rest each night... What they did was basically just created a snow hole. That's where you dig a hole in the snow and you sit in the hole. Uh, so they would dig these snow holes. They would eat supplies and drink water, which they brewed from snow by melting it using uh, a gas cooker. So they had this little gas cooker, and they would just put snow into the, uh, you know, into the the pan and melt the snow to create water. They called it brewing or making a brew. Now. In any day, in any day of your life, whatever it is you're doing, water is vital, isn't it? Now, apparently, we're supposed to drink about two litres of water a day, and that's just a normal day. Now, can you imagine, like, going to work for eight hours and not drinking any water all day? You'd feel really thirsty uh, at the end of the day, wouldn't you? You'd be parched. You'd be dying of thirst at the end of that day. Now, imagine going to the gym and getting really hot and doing loads of exercise. You'd need more water, right? You'd be really thirsty. Now imagine spending the entire day in the gym, doing workout all day, okay? Now imagine doing the whole thing at 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 meters up at altitude because you get a lot more dehydrated at altitude. Your body has less oxygen, so it's working a lot harder Uh, And so um, it dehydrates itself. I'm not sure of the science, but essentially at that altitude, your body needs a lot more water, especially when you are doing, you know, uh, very difficult physical exercise all day long. And apparently they needed about four to five litres of water per day each. And the way that they did it was using a gas stove. And apparently it took them about an hour to brew the water Uh, And it took longer, again, because of the altitude. So now my experience of being at altitude, I don't know if you've ever been at at a very high altitude, you know, if you've uh, climbed a mountain or something similar. Up there, the air is thin. Um, It feels like there's pressure. It feels like your heart beats faster and heavier. Um, You know, it really goes like nobody's business. You know, it goes really fast. And that makes you panic a little bit sometimes because you you feel like the air is thin. Um, And certainly for Joe and Simon, water would have been absolutely essential. And so was the gas that they 
uh, used to brew the water at night in their snow caves. Now, they have brought enough gas for what they expected was just about three to four days of climbing. So they had about three to four days of gas, which meant that they basically had about three to four days of water. Um, and also added to that, apparently they didn't brew and drink as much water as they should have done because it took so much time and they were conserving their gas. So they didn't bring enough gas. They didn't drink quite enough water. And it's probably little errors like this which may have contributed to the greater problems that they experienced later. So day two, um, they started climbing again at an altitude that they'd never climbed at before. So neither of them had even climbed at that level before. Uh, And apparently much of it on day two involved ice climbing, which looks really difficult and dangerous. That's basically where you're climbing up vertical sheets of ice. Um, And they do it using ice picks. So you have ice picks in both hands and spikes on your feet. And they you, you hammer in the ice picks into the ice, hammer them in in front of you, and you spike into the ice with your feet and you just kind of raise yourself up uh, bit by bit like that, hammering in with the ice picks and with your feet and then kind of climbing up like that. I can only imagine that there there must have been a lot of moments where they weren't attached to anything. They weren't attached to the to the mountain except for their spikes. They must that must have happened a lot of the time. They were both just spiked in, holding on literally with their hands. Uh and uh if one of them had fallen, the other one would have gone too. I mean, it terrifies me, to be honest, when I think about it. After a certain amount of time, the higher they got, the colder it got, and also the worse the conditions became. And they ended up sort of climbing into a horrible snowstorm. There was strong wind and heavy snow. Apparently the powder snow was coming down and across the mountain face like avalanches. It was just all this powder pouring down and flying across, being brought by the strong wind, a bit like an avalanche. Now, imagine being on the beach, okay, down near the sea, being on the beach when there's a very high wind. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced that, like being on the sandy beach with high wind, the sand gets whipped up into the air by the wind and it throws the sand into your eyes and you can't see and it stings your, your face. I imagine it must have been a bit like that, but high at altitude, stuck on the side of a mountain in freezing cold conditions with the wind whipping up all of this powder snow and flying it across you and on top of you. Uh, apparently the snow... What happened was that the snow would stick to their clothing and then it would freeze and stick there. And eventually it was like wearing a suit of armour with all this frozen, a frozen layer of snow on top of them. It it would have been like incredibly heavy climbing with this frozen suit of armour on top of them all the time. According to Joe, the the last part of that face was some of the most nightmarish climbing that he'd ever done. The snow was very unstable because it was made of powder and so he couldn't get a secure footing or any anchors in there. So they would have been just sort of dragging themselves up this powder snow in these conditions with no anchors, like nothing attaching them to the rock. Oh, horrible. Apparently it took them five to six hours to climb just 200 feet. Just 200 feet, five to six hours. And remember that they were doing alpine climbing. So while one of them climbed, the other one waited. So while waiting for Simon to climb, Joe was just sitting motionless on the mountain, sitting still. And I don't know if you've ever like been motionless for any length of time in very cold conditions. Uh, Eventually, your body uh, can go into hypothermia. And apparently, Joe was getting close to hypothermia. Now, hypothermia is a condition caused by getting too cold. It's basically where the, where the body loses more heat than it can generate and your body temperature drops below 35 degrees centigrade. Uh, and the symptoms are shivering, uh, clumsiness or lack of coordination, slurred speech or mumbling, confusion and poor decision-making, 
such as uh, trying to remove warm clothes and drowsiness or very low energy. So Joe apparently was sort of nearing hypothermia at this point. And as the sun went down and everything went dark, they decided that they couldn't go on. And so they managed to dig a snow cave and rest. Okay, now on day three, apparently um, uh, the storm had passed and the sun was out. And so in the morning, they came out of the snow cave and they could see everything that they tried to achieve the previous afternoon and evening. So they got to survey all the stuff that they'd been doing in the middle of the storm previously. And apparently what they saw were these unbelievable, amazing formations of snow. Apparently the powder snow was all stuck to the side and the top of the mountain in these extraordinary shapes like big marshmallows, meringue and mushrooms with large fluffy round lumps of snow overhanging from the top of the mountain. It must have been an absolute nightmare to see. Imagine you're on the side of a mountain, you've got to climb to the top, you look up and it's just all these marshmallows and mushrooms that you've got to somehow climb over and it's all made of this powder snow which is somehow stuck to the, uh, stuck to the mountainside without falling off. Apparently in the Alps, which is where Joe and Simon had much more of their experience, uh, this kind of powder snow just falls off uh, the mountain. It just falls off because it's, it's not sticky. But for some reason in the Andes, it stuck and it formed these extraordinary shapes. Now for me, seeing the documentary, which as I said, contains the reconstructions of the climb filmed on the same mountain, it looks like an alien planet or something. And it really gives the impression of a strange, unknown place with its own character, different to the mountains that we have in Europe. And remember that no one had ever done that climb before. So it must have been like going into outer space or something. Scary, but exciting and also otherworldly. Imagine a massive mushroom made of white powder. Okay, it's, it looks like a mushroom because of the overhanging snow. Now imagine that mushroom six kilometres up in the sky. Okay, now imagine trying to climb over it from the base all the way up to the top. How on earth did they manage it? I've got no idea. Um, it just shows that they were both extraordinary climbers, that's for sure. Um, apparently it was extremely precarious. Uh, extremely pre- precarious. If something's precarious, it means that... Uh, it could fall at any moment. And it means literally precarious. Like imagine if you put your mobile phone right on the edge of the table, like I've just done. I just dropped it, by the way. Imagine if you put your phone right on the edge of the table, it's a bit precarious. Uh, Imagine, you know, being right on the edge of a mountain, that's a bit precarious. Precarious is a word that can be used literally or figuratively. For example, you could say that the economy is is in a precarious state. So, I think it must have been extremely precarious and also unnerving as well. And they were apparently very scared. They were very scared that they might not make it. And when they got onto the North Ridge, they promised to themselves that they would never climb an Andean mountain again. Um, And in fact, they considered stopping at that point. So they did manage to get up the West Face onto the North Ridge. And then I think they were like, right, that's enough of this and we're never going to do this again i don't know if you've ever had an experience like that where you do something and it's really dangerous and you think i'm never ever going to do this again i'm just going to go home and i'm just going to stay in my home for the rest of my life i'm never going to take any other risks it must have felt like that but they were there on the north ridge of the mountain they considered stopping at that point because they were both exhausted But they thought to themselves, well, we've come all this way. We might as well stand on the top of the mountain. So they ascended the North Ridge and they made it to the top. And what a feeling that must have been. They actually did it. The first people to climb the western face and reach the summit of the mountain. And you can see in the documentary there are extraordinary shots of the mountain and the feeling of epic space around the the peak of the mountain, above the clouds, sticking out into the sky. It it looks incredible. Now, the next challenge they had is to get back down. And apparently, 80% of accidents on a mountain happen on descent. Then actually, the descent is much more dangerous than the ascent. So actually, although they'd 
they felt lucky that they'd managed to get through what felt like a nightmare experience already. The challenge was all ahead of them, in fact. And you know what? This is the end of part one of this episode. Um, This feels like a good place to stop. But um, you've got to listen to part two because the story hasn't even started yet. Uh, Everything's going to happen in part two. So we're going to stop here. Thanks for listening up to this point. And I'll speak to you in part two. Okay, so for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye. Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.